Welcome to the Mayo Clinic Ophthalmology Podcast, brought to you by Mayo Clinic. I'm your host, Dr. Andrea Tooley. And I'm Dr. Eric Bothan. We're here to bring you the latest and greatest in ophthalmology, medicine, and more. We have the opportunity today to visit with Dr. Stephen McLeod and this podcast here at the Mayo Clinic. Dr. McLeod is the CEO of the American Academy of Ophthalmology. Today, we will chat about the AAO, his leadership roles and things that are currently hot topics and things that are being evaluated, worked on, and dreamed about at the AAO, and what he sees for the future of our profession. Dr. Stephen McLeod is Professor of Ophthalmology and Chair Emeritus at the Department of Ophthalmology for the University of California, San Francisco. He is the CEO of the American Academy of Ophthalmology. Prior to assuming his CEO role, Dr. McLeod was the Editor-in-Chief of our Blue Journal, Ophthalmology. He served on the board of the ABO and the Council of AOS, the American Ophthalmological Society. He's also heavily involved with clinical trial design, research implementation, practices cornea, cataract, and refractive surgery. Surgery. Welcome, Dr. McLeod. It's a pleasure to be here. We love this podcast opportunity um, to, to sit down with people that are leaders in our field. In this case, leaders, a leader in our organization that represents us is an exciting opportunity. So I just, we appreciate the, the, the time we'll spend. No, my pleasure. Yes, it's fantastic to have you here to get to pick your brain about ophthalmology in general, what it even means to be the CEO of AAO. So it's great. Thanks for being here. Let's start with actually that. What does the position as a CEO of our American Academy of Ophthalmology mean? And you know, what do you do in that role? What does, how does that consume your life? And you know, how would you characterize it for those of us that are just caring for patients every day? Well, you know, it, it really is a, a, a tremendous opportunity and, a, you know, a, a tremendous honor to, to, to actually um, have, have the opportunity to serve in the role. You know, what we do in the academy really is to bring together the voice of the profession um, in order to help each other with, uh, with our educational uh, materials, to help to establish quality uh, standards for patient care. Uh, to, to really um, have an, an aggregated voice to be able to uh, advocate um, effectively uh, in, in, um, in, uh, in D.C. and at the state level. And, you know, all of this is for us as a profession, ultimately, to be able to do a better job in caring for our patients. And, you know, that's so, sort of how it all rolls up into the, into the academy uh, motto, which is, um, or our, our vision statement, which is um, to, to protect sight and to empower lives. I think a lot of listeners might not understand kind of the nitty gritty of how academy even works, the difference between the president, the CEO, is it a one-year term, a many-year term? Mm -hmm. It's a huge thing. You moved to San Francisco. You have stepped down from being chair. Um, you know, you stepped down from being editor of the Blue Journal. You've taken on this many-year position. Talk to us about like what the data. What what is the job? What do you do? Yeah. So um, you know the um, the 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 American Academy of Ophthalmology really is a member and a member run organization through effectively through its uh, its uh, governance with the board of trustees which ends up being the the group that represents the interests of of members and the office of the academy effectively uh, serves the needs and the direction of the board of trustees now the way that the governance structure works of course is that there is uh, uh, a very healthy turnover of leadership within the board of trustees and so um, essentially the the academy office becomes to some extent the uh, the voice of continuity that runs through the organization and so we try to make sure that we have initiatives that are immediate that come up from uh, from the membership and uh, and from the board um, but there's also a a bedrock of stability as it were for those things that are the long-term projects that we all need to work on to steadily advance the um the, the organization so you know the way that that the academy is actually 
is is actually organized is under um, various divisions that try to meet the various needs that we have. So, you know, obviously we've got member services and we have advocacy, we've got, um, which works obviously both at the, the state and the local level, we have communications. Um, and as, as far as uh, those, those uh, divisions that are really outward facing, the other two that people um, know very well are going to be um, our quality and data and then our education. And effectively, um, what the, the, the office and the CEO does is to coordinate those activities, but make sure that they really are focused on uh, both meeting the immediate needs of, of, of the, ophthalmolo uh, the ophthalmology community. And again, I think an important point is that um, we are really trying to, to, to structure and to serve in a way that meets the needs of the entire care delivery team. So, um, so, so that it really ultimately ends up being in the service of ophthalmology. G. Phenomenal. It's a nice to kind of think about that in these different um, at, or veins of effort that, has, that are kind of ongoing, as you're saying, the bedrock of what we do to support and what we hope our national organization um, is working on. In your position, I'm sure there are fires, though, too, yeah. where you have in, you know, the you have in in the sense of a vein, a leaky yeah. vein, or whatever it might be. But yeah. so, what are the, get an example of some of the fires in ophthalmology? That's because we we want to continue to promote this wonderful profession that we celebrate, yeah. and yet things are can confront it, attack it, challenge it, and I'm sure that ends up some of your your day-to-day -day work is putting out fires. Oh, absolutely. I mean, you know, sort of, I think that one of the, the things that will immediately come to mind for people, things like, you know, um, drug shortages and uh, the extent to which um, we can uh, try to, to, to advocate for um, policies and uh, that, that help to alleviate or, or, um, or, or address uh, some of these issues uh, going forward. Um, you know, another one that I think uh, people are very familiar with um, would be things like um, the prior authorization changing mm -hmm. rules that emerge out of out of nowhere, and yes. and uh, many of which uh, are really not tied to any sort of any sort of uh, clinically relevant science, and so that becomes uh, really our one of our primary responsibilities to try to raise awareness to to advocate um, at a uh, at a federal level for rules to really try to interface directly with the companies to to try to, to understand um, what is driving the decision making and to, to try to redirect that decision making and you know as, as you can imagine a lot of these things just sort of emerge on a weekly basis but you know at the same time it, it's really important for us to to have a a committed and dedicated structure to to advance to to address the longer term issues that 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 way over the profession. I, mean, I think that the one that people would would very easily um, uh, uh, reach to is going to be um, physician payment structures, um, and so you know that's one of those issues that. Um, it's a constant that 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 we we have to to keep working on. Um, it always flares up towards the end of the fiscal uh, year, and uh, Congress has to make its decision on on um, what the conversion factor is going to be in the very next year, and whether that pool is going to stay the same or or shrink. And um, and it becomes uh, up to us, and oftentimes in collaboration with many of our colleagues across the House of Medicine, um, to 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 bring the message uh, to to DC that you know at least for this year we need a fix. That's the short term, but the long term is we keep plugging away at what is going to be a long term sustainable fix for uh, the way that that um, that physician payment is structured under Medicare. Um, there's uh, you know another good example of where we we um, see changes that happen on a on a uh, periodic basis where we have to be very vigilant and to uh, raise attention and try to redirect policy is the way that um, Medicare Advantage um, manages things like prior authorization the way that step therapy is being moved into that domain and so yes we have a number of fires but we also need to make sure we're taking care of the fires and keeping an, an eye on the things that need long-term structural uh, redress that's great. I want to come back on that. You, I, you, you commented about you know, reimbursement and how that is. It seems like it's a, a dam that's breaking. We're just keeping putting fingers in different pieces, mm -hmm. and we're always losing ground with yeah. each new crack and each new finger. Yeah. Share with us just your perspective on how how do 
how do you and the leadership structure approach that with yeah. optimism, hope, or, or, or on the flip side, pessimism, <laughs> yeah. which is yeah. depression? Okay. How do you work through yeah. and give us a, a sense of what the progress is yeah. being made and what is the hope that in five years we won't have to be still yeah. nitpicking over defending our practice? Yeah, so, so I think that the, 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 the optimistic piece comes from the, the fact that um, health care is something that is, uh, is tremendously valued by our population and it's recognized to be a value by legislators. And so um, there is, it's not an issue that is ever going to go away. And so it does mean that there is constant pressure on legislators to try to fix them. Now, you can kick the can down the road and you can keep kicking it, but the, but the fact of the matter is, it is something that is incredibly highly valued by the population, by voters. And for us to, to, to make sure that we keep attention on that is something that, that um, you know, does give us hope. I mean, what, what does make it very difficult is if you just look realistically at the, at the, um, at the, the history um, of, uh, of, of, of payment and, um, and uh, uh, Medicare reform, um, nothing ever happens quickly. Um, there are a lot of failed experiments along the way, and there's more and more inertia built into the system because there is, you know, a huge amount of money built in the system. That said, you know, there are existing structures that, if applied specifically to the physician payment component, uh, um, actually make sense. I mean, you you have. Um, uh, uh, you know, a, an inflationary index that is applied to um, virtually all other aspects of, of, of healthcare payment that if it was simply a, applied to physician payments would actually go a long way in solving the problem. So it's not as if there isn't a, a you know, a, 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 a structure of precedent that can reasonably be applied um, to physician payment. But but it is, it is a, a heavy lift because of the cost. But the counter to the cost is that it is perceived as value. One of the challenges we have is to make sure that there isn't ambiguity about the value that we're um, that we're um, uh, providing um, with the care that we deliver. But if we can make a good case for value, um, there is a there is obviously an enduring case for the importance of what we do. Yeah, well said. And I certainly those of us that understand that lift, heavy, heavy, heavy as it is, can certainly recognize and appreciate. The teamwork and the the massive amount of effort that the academy has mm -hmm. behind that. So even though there's always individuals that question how, whether we're doing enough, I yep. just applaud what is being done and continue the lift as as it is because it's obviously of great mm -hmm. of great value. Yeah, it's so important for all of us. You know, you've talked about kind of the day to day, every week changing these short term mm -hmm. fires that you're putting out, and then this morning you talked about kind of some long term mm -hmm. goals and visions. You talked about kind of the future with ophthalmology in terms of health equity mm -hmm. and fighting disparities in ophthalmology and our patients. And then even at lunch we talked with the residents and I loved how you mentioned you can't get bogged down in the day to day minutia so that you forget about your long goals yeah. and that you can't work on the, the long term things. Yeah. So tell us about some of the long term big goals, kind of the, those heavy lifts and, yeah. and long-term goals. Yeah. I think that, you know, at the end of the day, as, as physicians, the most important thing to us is how well do our patients do um, under our individual care and under our care as a part of a, of a health delivery system. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, the, the question is, at this point in time, you know, are we consistently delivering the kind of quality across all of the things that we do that really reflect, the, you know, the highest and best of what we can do? And the truth of the matter is there's always room for improvement. Mm -hmm. The way that we, as the world evolves, we recognize that the way that we get to that improvement is really, first of all, um, through gathering the data that describe, you know, what are the outcomes of what we're doing now? Um, that then allows us to say, um, what are the potential things that we could change to do a better job? In the right environment where we really can aggregate um, uh, effort and, and, and people, 
uh, we can actually then start to test, okay, what are the changes that we can make and do those make a difference? And once we identify the ones that can make a difference, we can go back and then try to um, make that as much as possible standard practice. Um, th that's something that uh, you know, on a case-by-case -case basis is incredibly expensive and difficult to do. But if you actually have a, um, uh, a well-integrated uh, data and information system and people really participating in this effort, then it can really accelerate how well we're able to understand and modify our care to deliver higher quality. And that's really what we're trying to, to, to get to within the academy as as the nexus of of information in terms of uh, care and outcomes and you know embedded in that is um is is a is a is a really important element that that we talked about a little bit this morning which is um if our goal really is to get to the highest quality of care we want that quality to to, to be universal. Mm -hmm. And it's that universal high quality which directly addresses the question of, 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 of health equity that is embedded in there. So, you know, th those, are, those are goals that are, are entirely aligned, uh, quality and equity. And, and it's really that community, that very coherent community that we have in ophthalmology now um, ever more linked with, uh, you know, with, with uh, a, a network of EMRs that we can interrogate through the IRIS um, a database and otherwise that we really can come together as a community to transform care. It's a perfect segue. I was wanted to touch on the Iris Registry, yeah. just um, big data and how it how it's evolving. Yeah. You know, compared to five ten years ago. Now, most national meetings you'll hear big data um, outcomes in one yeah. form or another, and it, very much the academy continues to support involvement yeah. in that. Yeah. Give us an update on how, what your perception's been for people in academic practice and yeah. just what does it mean tangibly for someone in private practice, how to engage in the registry, yeah. um, w w what they can get out of it and what, what would the ask would be to yeah. participate. Yeah. yeah, so so the good thing is that um, particularly um, built around uh, the incentives that um, the uh, Medicare's um, uh, um, MIPS program has been ten, b built in. Um, there really has been a lot of energy behind getting um, uh, uh, practices in, in private practice to get into EMRs, get their um, their data um, into registries, and 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 really help to use those data to to guide um, uh, uh, their examination of practice outcomes. Um, it's been more difficult for academic medical centers because, as as you well know, when you're in systems of care, there are ways that you then can essentially circumnavigate the, uh, the, 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 the MIP system. And so for academic centers, the incentive has really more been um, a recognition of the importance of being able to, to get to aggregated data um, for research purposes. Uh, so it's generally been actually a bit more straightforward for um, for smaller practices than it has with academic practices. But of course, you know, when you're trying to to get a data set that truly reflects the broad, the, the true breadth of, of pathology and care out there, you really want to capture as, as many as possible. That's getting a lot better now. Um, I think that for us in ophthalmology, the other thing that I think a lot of people recognize is that we are a very, very visual subspecialty. And there's a lot of data that we have that is that is going to be an imaging data and we're we're really just getting to the stage now that we can really start to incorporate a lot more imaging data you know into our data sets the other piece that's actually um, very important is again you know when we think back to you know our our, um, our, our uh, statement to, you know to protect sight and empower lives the empower lives piece of it is very important as well and um, at present what we don't always have is as good an integration between the information we have about vision and um, and eye health, uh, and and the rest of, of the patient's um, health. And so, um, uh, getting to the point that we can better integrate um, the eye data with the rest of the the medical record, um, so that we can we can really address our questions holistically, um, is going to be another. Uh, it's a it's another big challenge, but it's a, it's another big potential area for. for for, for growth. So you'll have to forgive me. I still don't quite understand how the Iris Registry works. Yeah. And this morning I heard, heard you saying that you can actually access singular photographs from 
individual patients. Is that right? Or it's all in aggregate? It's big data. Maybe I'm yeah. totally missing it. So, Break it down. <laughs> yeah. So, so basically, the way that the system works is, you know, you have your EMR, mm -hmm. and um, you know, you just enter your data. Um, it goes into the servers, and then periodically. Um, there actually is um, uh, a, an extraction from your servers that then flows into um, the, um, the the Iris Registry servers. Now you do the the data are de-identified, mm -hmm. um, and then those data, those de-identified data, um, are are aggregated within Iris. Now. It, um, it um, those data come from different sources, and to, to uh, and originally we didn't really have a good way of also importing uh, 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 images, fundus images or otherwise. Mm -hmm. So that's really what um, what our uh, uh, data science group, and this has really um, been efforts led by Aaron Lee at Wash at at, um, at uh, University of Washington. Um, we are now better able to to uh, and it's you know obviously these are, these are this is a very data heavy import along with um, individual um, EMR text EMR we're also able to import um, uh, the the fundus imaging so so those now are living as a very large de-identified um, uh, bank um, mm -hmm. within Iris, but it is coded by you know it's coded by by disease, etc. Diagnosis, yeah. code. so it is accessible. So it is accessible. Um, it's uh, at, at this point we're really still um, figuring out uh, sort of what are the the best ways to to arrange the architecture, etc. And um, and uh, so uh, at this point, when you look at a lot of the Iris studies that that have come out, they've really been um, based on the more easily extracted things. Things like you know um, uh, diagnosis codes, codes and IOPs right. and thing and visual acuities and mm -hmm. so on, but we're really trying to get to the point that we can now try to to um, to to to, to um, link with that not just the um, the text data but the image data as well. That's fantastic. And are these data able to be utilized? For clinical trials, or is that something completely ah, different? Great question. So, um, essentially, once you get into the territory of the clinical trial, you're essentially saying, um, "Can you use these? Um, you know, can you use these data prospectively?" And there are there is a whole um, avenue of 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 work, um, basically called the pragmatic um, clinical trial. And so, you know, the the um, the grandfather of this was a so-called um, taste trial, which was essentially Essentially, a trial that um, that looked at um, at uh, managing um, the best way to to um, to, to to manage um, uh, uh, um, uh, acute MI, and essentially what they did was they used the electronic medical record as essentially the um, the date the the data record for the trial. So essentially. Mm -hmm. The way it's structured is you try to, to arrange your trial so that it is asking a question that um, that is pr very much within um, the domain of your typical standard care. It's already but then, in the yeah, EMR. Yeah, so there is so it's in the EMR. All the fields are there, and you're basically just making a decision between one choice in standard of care versus another standard of care, mm -hmm. and then essentially you you know you 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 randomize, but it's all prospective, and then you gather the data and uh, and you extract it from the EMR. Mm -hmm. So that's actually a very very inexpensive way of running a clinical trial mm. and it's essentially you know um, and so there are obviously you know um, limitations around the type of trial you can put in there but essentially for what for a lot of what we do in medicine um, it's not that we're introducing something new we're saying there are a whole bunch of different ways that people do the same thing, yes. which is the best way to do it. Exactly. You can attack that question observationally, just say, oh, there, I've got so much data with so many different, but there are so many biases, obviously, built into the choices people make, that as long as you can get people to be fairly comfortable with the idea um, that um, that uh, uh, they are going to um, they, they they will actually prospectively randomize, you can actually just take that mechanism and 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 act and, and generate a lot of of, of data that helps you with clin with practical cl uh, clinical decision making. Mm. With the, in your landscape and connecting with individuals with research ideas and proposals and now big data and everything is coming. 
you know, AI is emerging as a tool that's sort of opening our new horizon and yeah. what we might do, whether it's in writing a college paper yeah. or in mm-hmm. helping us understand different demographics about the systemic health of a patient for yeah. diabetic retinopathy yeah. or cataract. Um, share with us the con- your sense of the conversation as this is a moving landscape on what you see. And I know that even this morning mm-hmm. we talked about how AI is being introduced in certain studies. Mm-hmm to look longitudinally or prospectively at patient care modeling. But share with us the types of ideas or concepts or what your vision might be. You commented, you used the word empowerment. I think everyone's afraid that we're going to lose our jobs for the X, Y, or Z or opportunity to care for patients. But in the theme of empowerment, share with us that positive hope of what we might tangibly bring to our patients because of AI linked with the data that you have in Iris and other locations? Yeah, so, so uh, you know, the AI conversation is all over the place. And because the thing is, there's, it's, it's actually hard to identify any sort of space in medicine where you can't make a case that there is a potential role for AI there. So I think that I, I would sort of um, divide it up into, into, into a few sort of big domains. The one that people, I think, tend to get a little bit um, carried away with is the whole area of clinical decision support and the degree to which um, clinical decision support transitions to being independent cl- clinical decision making. Um, you know, that's a huge conversation we can put off for now. I think that, you know, much more accessible um, and much more immediate is is the recognition that there is an enormous amount of work that we do as physicians and then in the in the care del- along the care delivery pathway that is um, repetitive, that is, you know, not particularly cognitive. That is just a lot of, of busy work. And then there are other things that, that, are, that do actually require the physician's touch, but, but the pathway there sort of has a lot of things in it that we, we probably don't need to be doing. And when you, when you ask the question, what is it that is going to change the landscape for things like physician reimbursement when we have a growing um, patient population, we have growing needs, and you know, that, that, you know, um, resources are shrinking, I think that it is, it is the use of AI in the care delivery pathway, whether it is, you know, for example, um, AI systems that are now acting as the, you know, the, the transcriptionists that then, you know, prepare, you know, your note for you that you then get to review and that at the same time it extracts what you've said to the patient and creates the patient after visit summary so that, you know, and then, but it's not as if you're giving it all away, but the things that you used to do by hand and then say, okay, I like it, it's that much more efficient now because there's a prepared document for you. You just make sure it, it's consistent with what you would like and you send it out the door. Um, there's, uh, you know, all of the billing, coding. Front. There are just so many tasks that get done that if we can figure out how to get, um, you know, AI integrated, then then you can, you know, start asking the questions about decision support and whether. And now, which is not to discount at all, um, you know, a lot of the 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 importance of the decision support work. Um, I just think that that that. Um, discussion sometimes gets a little bit um, derailed by people saying, what is my role going to be versus the robots? Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that the, um, the, 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 the statement that the, um, the radiologists have used for a long time has been, um, you know, people don't need to worry that, um, uh, that you know, the AI systems are going to make radiologists go away there are going to be two types of radiologists, the ones that use AI and the ones that don't, and that the ones that don't that are going to go away. Mm-hmm. Well Makes said. sense. Yeah. I, I feel like I see AI, especially within ophthalmology, especially within care in underserved areas, as such an extension of our abilities, screening potential. You know, we're already seeing use of it for screening in the VA, mm-hmm. and that's where it I see the most potential, and then also with international work and outreach, getting mm-hmm. getting people to have eye exams and screening mm-hmm. and vision checks, and getting them plugged in in places where they wouldn't have had access. And to me, that's exciting. Mm-hmm. 
Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. I know I kind of want to segue to, to yeah. talking about some international work, too, because yeah. I know that's a passion for you yeah. and that you're um, trying to increase international engagement within the Academy, yeah. which is super exciting. Yeah. And so um, tell us a little bit about, about international yeah. ophthalmology, kind of what, what you see for that and, and what your goals are and vision with yeah. that. You know, so, you know, um, the, the American Academy of Ophthalmology really has developed a tremendous um, education and support resources for ophthalmologists um, and for ophthalmology. And, and one thing that's very important to us is to try to make sure that these resources are as, as available as possible to the wide world of, of, of ophthalmology. And um, so when we when we when we um, when we think about um, the 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 impact that we can have, um, we do recognize that yes, it's true that um, there are there is a tremendous um, uh, spectrum of environment out there, and there is and and different regions have different needs, um, but there certainly are core resources that that we need to try to to, to make available. To help the world of ophthalmology, and that um, we we really see our role as as being really a resource, not just for for care in the United States, but but care care globally. Well said. Yeah. I, I I appreciate in the past there's even a registry AAO. Is it still mm -hmm. there? Is that something? Because we've within the Peds Ophthalmology yep. at APOS, I've I am on the international. Um, committee of APOS, and we've talked about sort of how you generate and sustain resource opportunities um, in a way that's tangibly um, searchable, yeah. but mm -hmm. also stays current, knowing yeah. how each site can change and experience can change. Share with yeah. us, is, is the registry still active at AAO, and or is there another resource by which ophthalmologists seeking international opportunities yeah. could turn. Yeah, so that's actually something that we've um, put quite a bit of effort into. It was actually uh, Rich Abbott who um, who uh, put the first um, iteration. Uh, but we actually have a very well-maintained um, uh, site on the web that allows uh, individuals to, to, um, to use a series of drop-down menus to really tailor the searches to try to identify what resources and what mentors in which specialties, whether they're paid or unpaid, et cetera, et cetera, are available um, globally. And um, it's it's a resource that is 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 really um, very well used. Um, of course, uh, one of the things that is is always uh, challenging is to make sure that it is as updated as possible. But it's something that we really are trying to keep um, green, active, and alive. And and people do use it um, very heavily. It's it's a it's a very useful resource and very well. So you know, we, we always thank Rich for that. Yeah, wonderful <laughs> plug. Love it, Dr. McLeod. I want to ask you too. Knowing everything you know, being as engaged as you are, how would you suggest that community the ophthalmologist, a general ophthalmologist in, in private practice, how can they engage with ophthalmology nationally, internationally, and then how can an international ophthalmologist, someone yeah. from ac across the globe, engage with Academy? Yeah, so so I would say um, there are, for, for local ophthalmologists, the things that it, it actually is always going to be important for local ophthalmologists to be involved in their local and state societies. Yes. It's a really, really important thing. And, and we, we see ourselves as, as supporting state societies. Um, that's a really important thing for us. Um, but but we think that that is it is very important for that engagement to be both um, with the local community, but of course also with, with the larger with the larger community. Um, you know there are there are a tremendous um, number of opportunities for engagement um, with the, the larger academy. You know that you can always uh, go onto the, the the website and identify you know your areas of interest so that you know you can be called for committee and so on. Um, but you know the other thing is that um, we we really feel that even things like um, the annual meeting, that so much of the um, the effectiveness and the and the the dynamism of the of the annual meeting is actually really drawn from our members using that opportunity to come together and to learn from each other as much as they learn from you know the uh, um, the uh, key opinion leaders <laughs> uh, you know and uh, so so a lot of it really is 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 um, is is both uh, local and academy engagement. 
and um, we 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 actually really want to hear from our members as to what we can be doing with our programs to make sure that we're meeting them where 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 they need. Yeah, that's outstanding. You have worn many hats, and you've been I just you know appreciated in many prominent you know whether it's the ABO or AAO and and our and leadership for our our profession. For the new ophthalmologists coming into practice or yeah. training, you, you know, we each have our own leadership yeah. journey, and some of us land in academic institutions because we like that. Yeah. I like the word dynamism <laughs> yeah. about being together yeah. in that cross pollinating, yeah. um, you know, iron sharpening iron professional work. Yeah. Um, how well, how would you encourage people new in the practice? Because there is this tendency of I yeah. just want to go and serve my patients from yeah. eight to five and go home to my kids. Yeah, yeah. and I think. I think what people are missing, maybe yeah. especially post COVID, yeah. is that connectivity, bond, vibrancy, encouragement, yeah. and then in particular the volunteerism to be within that a leader. And I really yeah. celebrate your plug of the state academy efforts yeah. and that opportunity for people. But for you, looking back at your leadership yeah. journey, you know, when did you feel that though that step into leadership was kindled? Yeah. With through ophthalmology, and how would you kindle it to yeah. people listening? Yeah, so so I'll I'll get back to, to to where you started, which is you know people have just come out. There are a lot of pressures on them. You know, you want to work and get home to the family. I, I think that you know um, we have a lot of, of of discussions now about about burnout, and you know the thing about uh, the stresses in in, in life is that you need support, you need community, you need to know you're not alone. You also need to sort of learn how, you know, how others manage um, the, the, these uh, challenges in professional life. And what I, what I worry about is it's, it's, it's to some degree um, isolation that exacerbates the desperation. Mm -hmm. And um, there's, there's a lot to be said simply for finding your friends. Mm -hmm. And, you know, um, a, a professional community is going to be a, a group of people who truly understand the challenges that you have. And, and it's there that, that, that we would encourage people to find it. Now, within those groups, you know, leaders will be born and some people may not want to be leaders. But, but it is really important to just be a part of that professional group. Well said. Very well said. I think it's so important. I cannot thank you enough. I was going to say, I just want to keep talking. I know, I know. This has been so fruitful. Really, thank yeah. you so much. Absolutely fantastic. Great pearls. Really great insight. I'm so glad you're our leader. So thank you for being here. <laughs> it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much. We'll look forward to more. And thank you again for everything you do and for all the listeners. Just uh, you know, appreciate what the AAO are, is doing and leaders and know um, that we just hunger for all of us to be together to keep doing it better for tomorrow. Yeah, ophthalmology really is the best. I'm glad we all agree. It's the best. <laughs> <laughs> you can find all episodes of the Mayo Clinic Ophthalmology Podcast on our website. Thank you for listening. And we definitely look forward to sharing more 